Okay, welcome to part two of the Carl Goodman uh, from Athletes Authority episode of the Athletic Development Show. Uh, if you haven't listened to last week's episode, you have to go back and listen to it. Uh, this one won't make any sense without it. Uh, cracking episode, lots of great information. Enjoy. Tell me, where did you get your sales skills from? Because you are a great storyteller and you're a great salesperson um and you know like it's part of the good natured ribbing that 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 you get that you're you know sales in and i think often in our industry and i've had this with with some of our staff and our interns and i'm like you need to sell this and they're like oh i don't want to do sales i'm a coach i'm like coaching is selling you are trying to tell someone the work you are putting out you're selling them on the work you put in now is what will generate the results you want in the future like it's all if you if you're generating buy-in by definition, someone needs to be selling for buy-in to occur. It's the, you know, the opposite word. How do you, where did you get that from? Did you always have that? Did you do a job? Because sometimes our first job can be quite a, a priming. Yeah, How did you- I, I, I have a great story. And I think it's something <laughs> okay. that everyone can probably take some value from and perhaps help them, help inform them as to the decisions that they might, they might make for themselves in their career if they choose hmm. to, um, to do this and to be an SNC coach. So for some quick context, um, I was a relatively gifted kid at school, but Mm -hmm. school did not work for me. Um, You got so bored. Yeah, I was so bored. The structure um, really, I I really didn't do well with the structure. I happen to also be one of those kids, you know who they are. They're relatively good academically. Um, They're reasonably good at sport, but they also play trumpet. They sing in the choir. They do every other extracurricular activity. um, And that was me. Mm. That worked really well for me in primary school because Mm. I I had friends and networks in, I had music mates and band mates, but I had sports mates. I had, um, you know, academic mates. it, It really worked for me. It was an asset for me in primary school. But I went to an all boys high school and the moment testosterone kicks in, in year eight, um, it started to become a a real difficulty for me to navigate school. I was a Mm. late bloomer. I didn't really hit puberty till halfway through year nine, year 10. Oh, that's tough. When when my voice broke. Yeah, halfway through year nine. So very much late. I think I was like 15. So you'd have been little, yeah? I was little, very, I was yeah. little, I still had a high voice, I still sung in the choir, all those things mm. around year seven, year eight, year nine. So I became a really big target. Mm. Um, and that, that meant that my final couple of years, I didn't finish school. Um, the last two years were exceptionally difficult for me. Mm. Um, it was always, you know, I was always thinking, how am I going to get through today? And I remember, I remember walking up, school bell had rung, I was walking to the bus stop and one of the guys who was, who regularly bullied me on the way through just gave me the biggest sack whack. He absolutely nailed this sack whack. And I, I was crippled. I could not move for about 40 minutes. I was just lying there. I was lying on my trumpet case, unable to move. And I missed all my buses. So I couldn't actually get home. And so by about, I don't know, 4.30 p.m. by the time I could actually get up, I went to the office and they closed the fire said, can you please call my mum? And so mum said, oh, look, I'll, I'll swing by before. She was an opera singer, so she worked nights. She right. somehow managed to get me home um, and she rushed off to work. And that afternoon, I walked down the hill um, to Fitness First St. Leonard's and I said, I want to join a gym. Mm. And that was the... That was the pivotal moment for me where I said, I need some body armor mm. because life is getting very difficult for me to navigate here. It was a very tough time. I don't, I, I don't dismiss how difficult emotionally that was. And I know there's a lot of people who experience similar types of years or, or chunks in their life. It was, it was very hard. So I joined this gym. Yeah, I, I, I was 15. I, I was 14, nine months or something like that. I, I remember when I, when I joined this gym. And for those who have been in the industry for a long enough time, you'll remember names like Shannon Ponton, who was mm. the biggest loser personal trainer. You'll remember names like Dane McDonald, who ran 
clean, who would ultimately run Clean Health Institute. Mm. These guys were the PTs that were at Fitness First and Leonard's when I joined. Oh, wow. It was a little mecca of training um, in Sydney. There are some really big names. Some IFBB pros were there. Um, right. It was, it was a real mecca. Talent um, hotbed. Yeah. And I had this terrible experience on day one. So day one, er- everyone will laugh. Um, the first thing you go to, I think like any kid, is you go to the bench press. Mm-hmm. And I remember failing 20 kilo Olympic bar bench press and I, I maybe got one or two reps or, or whatever. I was like, oh, this right. is too heavy. So I went bar- back to the, the, bar, the, the vertical bar stand. I grabbed another bar and had plastic sleeves and a thinner. Um, yeah. A thinner, um, like a pump bar type thing. Yeah, pump yeah. bar. It wasn't yeah. quite a pump bar. But it was probably about eight or 12 kilos. And I'd yeah. later find out that that was their version of female bar. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I put that on and I was actually even able to put on like 1.25 kilos. So maybe it was 15 kilos with the, with the weight. Mm. And I did a couple of reps and some big juiced up guy comes up to me and says, uh, mate, if you're going to fuck around with that pussy weight, get off and do some dumbbells. I need the bench. And so this is this is day one. Like day I've, just, one. I've just motivated myself to to kind of take some action and and oh. try and control a controllable here. And I've just been savaged by this guy yeah. on day one. Um, so I kind of do a few couple of other things. Obviously, I capitulate, get up, and, and do some dumbbell bench press mm. instead. But on my way down, um, I walked in the supplement shop, which was attached to fitness first and there was a guy called Mark who ran the supplement shop and he was this big, warm bear. Sorry, one second. You're getting snacks delivered. (laughs) Outstanding. (laughs) Classic. Um, I'll I'll just repeat big, warm bear. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Big, warm bear. Um, Yeah. And he, he was on the gear, but he was lovely. Yeah. And he took me under my wing. He gave me, we chatted for about half an hour. He gave me a tub of protein powder. I don't think he even made me pay for it and said, you come in here every day, I'll give you a workout and I'll get you used to the ropes. How awesome and this is guy, that? Mark, he, he owed me nothing. He owed yeah. me nothing. And from there on in, I, I went to the gym, rain, hail or shine, twice a day, every day until I would ultimately leave school in year 11. I would go before wow. training. I'd walk down, I would take a milk, I would train, I'd drink a milk on the bus. Um, and then on the way home after after school was done, I would go back to the gym and train again. Now, obviously I was I was completely over training and certainly yeah. probably didn't get results, but I got some newbie gains whatnot. Yeah. Um, and I really became part of that fitness first and learners community. Um, mm. Some people were assholes. Dane McDonald is still a fucking asshole. He was always an really? asshole back then. He's still an asshole still now. An asshole. <laughs> um, he he had no time for me. Um, but there are some awesome people. There yeah, some that's awesome great. people there. So I got my first job there. Wow. I became a fitness first receptionist at 15 years old. Wow. And that is where I started to develop my ability for sales. Mm. And so there's a little bit of story there. You know, my role, at least the way I saw it, was to set people on the right foot, Mm. was to have a meaningful interaction, connect with them and make them feel like they weren't a number. Because in Fitness Mm. First back in 2006, 2007, they were, they were getting exponential growth. Yeah. And you know, I, I saw my little role I can play is to connect, know their name, know what they do for a job, et cetera. Yep. I, I did a really good job um, as a receptionist and then um, was promoted. Back then you could actually pay kids like $8 an hour. Um, <laughs> so I think I got paid like $9 an hour with this yep. promotion, but I got promoted to sales. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just saw that as an extension of what I was already doing, mm. which was have a meaningful connection, listen, understand, empathize, see if it's a right fit, um, demonstrate some leadership, give them some guidance. Um, And by this point, I was feeling more comfortable in the gym. So, you know, I would impart some ideas and some strategies and say, look, if you're happy with what I'm telling you, 
you'll be amazed once you get a PT. They called it a triple pack back then. And everyone okay. got a triple yeah. pack for $79. Yeah. Um, I was like, wait till you start your triple packs. You know, it'll be amazing. And I'd, mm. I'd recommend PTs and I happen to be really good at it. Mm. Um, and I continued to do that um, up until I chose, I chose to leave somewhat my decision, somewhat the school's decision. I was completely off the rails by that point. Mm. Um, not attending class, just not happy with it at all. Mm. Um, so I, I, I did that part-time up until... So what what um, level school did you finish? So you finished I, year 10? I, 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 yeah, I finished year 10. And, you know, ironically, like, I'm, I'm not sure what the stats are now, but um, in my year 10, which was called school certificate, I still got the best mark in New South Wales for English. <laughs> Right. So like I was still I was talented. still capable. Yeah. And I still did like gifted and talented stuff in the holidays where you'd get sent off to unis and listen to uni lecturers and mm-hmm. so I always I felt like I had ability, but the school system had just absolutely it had broken me. It had mm-hmm. broken me. Um and I wanted to be at the gym. The gym yeah. was my home. School is not my home. I look yeah. forward to waking up to go to the gym and I look forward to finishing school so I could go back to the gym. Yeah. Um, yeah. and I enjoyed working there. So when I I left school halfway through year eleven, everyone had told me I'd made the worst decision in my life. My mum told me who who is who just walked in before. Oh, was that your mum? Um, oh, cool. That was my mum dropping off some cake. Thanks, mum. <laughs> um, my mum told me that I'd miss the train to my career. She said, if you mm. miss, if you don't get your HSC, um, it's like not getting a train ticket. So mm. you're going to have to walk or find some other really strenuous way to get to your destination which is pretty valid for most people like it's not a that's not a crazy perspective is it <laughs> yeah you know and certainly her experience too mm, um mm. And, and the way she grew up it was that that was her worldview. um so at that point once i'd left school i became full-time at fitness yep. first so between the year of 16 and a half through to 18 i was essentially full-time as fitness first salesman um and I was proud. It was a job I was proud of. Mm. Um, and I thought I was really good at um, because I had targets and I had KPIs and I, I got used to either meeting or not meeting targets. We had team targets back then, but mm-hmm. she didn't have personal targets. Um, so, so you know, sometimes we weren't successful and I, we had, I had a better team around me at some points than others. That's fascinating. Um, have you read The Talent Code, uh, Daniel Coyle's? I've heard of the book, but haven't read it. No. Okay, you're going to love it. Um, absolutely brilliant. He talks about how there are these talent hotbeds, these places that are disproportionate producers of tremendous talent. Right. And he talks about when you're trying to acquire a skill, one of the things you want is you need to have a an ignition point, a deep emotional connection to what you're trying to do, and then you need deliberate practice. So the ignition plus the deliberate practice is act- and so the example is there's a school there's a russian tennis school where you're not allowed to t- pick up a racket for the first year but the first year you just have to learn them to make the shapes of shots you can't pick the racket up um and he takes it goes all around the world does this in futsal and all sorts of different sports um and you were putting in those deeply invested reps in sales during your formative years that's mm. you couldn't you couldn't construct a situation better to make you strong at that that's fascinating and yeah and i didn't i didn't know where life was taking me i was still mm. a i was still a very jaded kid mm. at that point but it's the gym was my home and it's what i loved and it's what made me feel safe so mm. of course I, I i felt like i wanted to encourage people to do the same and, and maybe because I genuinely believe that. Yeah. It yeah. Maybe that, that was a reason why I was as successful as I was. And, and then the natural progression from there after that. Sorry to interrupt, was, because yeah. you've got some salespeople and you, they could just as happily be selling Mars bars, um, plane tickets, or, you know, like it's just insert commodity here into their yeah. process. That's actually a completely different beast to someone who deep in their soul feels that this is a thing you should do. It's yeah, a very I different sell way. Ma- I could not sell cars. I could not sell Mars bars. Um, I could yep. not sell software as a service. Um, mm. Certainly not to the capability that I feel like I have been able to do mm. historically. Mm. Um, so by that point, um, I loved training. I just loved it. Every minute, every waking hour was bodybuilding.com, T Nation, um, yep. watching bodybuilding inspirational videos of all the guys I used to absolutely love. Yep. Jay Cutler, 
wanted to, I was just, I, I lived and breathed it. It was yeah. everything to me. So I wanted to become a PT. And then once again, you know, personal training is a nat, it's a natural extension of the sales process, as you spoke about at the start. Mm. All selling is, is your ability to effectively persuade someone to take action that they're currently not doing. It's, mm. it's all it is. Mm. It's all the sales process is. If you're effective at being able to persuade someone to take action that they're currently not taking action, you will get the sale. And that starts the exchange. And that's how I've always looked at it. Mm. That's how I've always looked at it. Now, interspersed in there is obviously deep money problems. And being a good salesman was not the solution to my money problems. Mm. I was good at getting people on board, but I certainly wasn't good at making money. Mm. But I think it did give me the lessons that, um, it did give me the lesson that if you if you really want to be good at sales or you want to overcome your sales issues, you need to have a deep, deep understanding of why you care about this at all. Yeah. And you need to, I, you need to be willing to invoke that and mm. help someone else connect to that feeling. And I, that's why I'm so comfortable talking about this. Some people get uncomfortable talking about getting bullied or whatnot. It's a part of me. It's actually been a gift. Getting mm. bullied throughout high school was an absolute gift because I would not have found the gym in the way I found it without it. And I would not be here without it. Well, yeah, it's an alternate, like in the old, in the alternate reality where you're put in the right kind of school, uh, you might have gone down a completely different, also a good path, but it, it might have gone down a completely different path. And, you know, it could have been uh, maybe a more. Happened. Yeah, more my mum nearly sent me to a music school. Yeah, right. To an art school. And I would probably be playing trumpet right now. And you might well have been a mediocre trumpet player that ended up having to be a teacher of trumpet that found it quite boring. Right. <laughs> that Had you not been bullied, that could have been... 100%. It's a, it was really a true sign doors moment for me. To, mm. to, to, I'm really thankful for James for, for sack me that day because it was enough, it was enough yeah. pain and, and shame. It was mm. enough shame that I was willing to do something about it. That's amazing. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, that's probably been the process where I've developed my scale sales, sales skill set. But to, to the point you were saying of, or at least what I was saying, hmm. um, why I think someone should, should take a learning lesson from this or a lesson from this, um, is if you want to be good at, at this and, and carve out a career for yourself in the S&C industry, the very best thing you can do, drop what you're doing if you're not already doing it and start training people. Oh, my God, I could not agree more. Every single Learn to PT. One, please do it for yourself. Um, we get emails all the time. You know, hey, I'm studying exercise science. I'm looking at maybe doing a master's in EP or physio. You know, what would you recommend? I, I'm tr- having trouble kind of getting my foot in the door and getting started or finding a team hmm. um, or you know, getting my, my coaching business off the ground. I'm like, have you considered being a PT? Yeah, it's such a huge ground. You know, I started PTing in '99, and and I had a, and I and I fell in love with SNC in 2000. Like I fell in love with SNC in '99, and I got my first proper gig in 2003. But I made myself a rule that I wasn't allowed to call myself an SNC coach until 51 percent of my of my clientele was athletes, wow. and that took me. And <laughs> you know, it's like I've always hated the idea of some someone's a waiter and they tell you they're a writer. No, you're not. You're, you're a waiter. Like yeah. when someone's you're paying, a waiter you know, who writes on the weekend. <laughs> sure. Know? Yeah. So, but, but that that experience of having to just put in all those years of PT, having to learn about how it all works and how people work and having to get good at the sales and all of that stuff, that's huge. And if you just sidestep that and just hope you're just going to front up and suddenly magically going to use those coaching muscles that you've actually never. You spend all this time working on your prescription muscles and nothing on your coaching muscles. Yeah, like your persuasion muscles. Yeah, your persuasion on. muscles, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So yeah. when I started PT, um, Fitness First and Leonard's was the home of 32 personal trainers. It was, and, and so a lot. many of them, yeah, it was a lot of trainers. And so many of them were really, really good with some really big names. Um, not just male trainers like Shannon Ponton and, and Dane, there were great female coaches who made big names for themselves like Rachel Guy and a whole bunch of others. Um, it was dog eat dog there. Mm. And that in itself was a learning lesson. Mm. And I've, I've noticed a, a shift away from the coaching fraternity, away from those high risk, high yield opportunities like a fitness first rent scheme. Mm. And that's something me and Lockie have always bonded over is that's where we both started. And 
because we started in this this high risk environment where where it was do or die, and you, we were all competing for the same uh, market. Um, it teaches you things, and I think mm. I think we're probably we're probably risk averse in a very strange way. Like, why is a nineteen year old risk averse? Yeah, you've got your go whole on. life ahead of you. Go ahead and do and it. Why go ahead and do it? For part of a little bit. If you're a, if you're a guy, the part of your brain that assesses risk, it's not even online till you're twenty five. You're literally danger blind. Like just yeah. you know, go 100%. for it. You know, and we but we see it all the time. Oh, yeah. I, think, I I don't think I want to do that. I think I'll you know just get a job at Vision. You know, they'll pay me pay me a wage. I'm like, okay, well, if if you want to do that, there'll be consequences. Yeah, you know, I think there'll I'm, be things things you want to be able to do that you can't do and then you'll be you'll be locked down by this allure of security mm. um so i, I strongly yeah. agree hey um you've been so generous with your time have i got time for a couple more questions i i have nothing booked deal for yet so. <laughs> okay good. well we won't take that much time but um you've talked in the podcast about some of the mistakes you made and and so many of them resonated with me because I was like I was like we were twins I was like I made exactly that mistake there's just a lot of the mistakes you make coming up one of the great things that you do now is you mentor in, in a formal sense you have a product where you you mentor aspiring coaches and I think that's really worth worth checking out um, what are the um, what are the big mistakes if you had you know like a lot of the mistakes you make are actually useful because you they, they make you who you are. But there are also some where it's just like, oh, if I'd have known that, I could have saved myself a fair bit of heartbreak. Yeah. Are there a couple of key mistakes that you look back on what you did? And, you yeah. you, you know, if you could talk to younger you, you'd say, hey, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, maybe maybe I can talk about some mistakes from each of the main kind of journeys. You know, mm. Carl, the personal trainer journey, Carl, the young gym owner journey, and, you know, Carl, the, the gym owner who's been battling for a couple of years. Yeah, journey. awesome. Maybe. Yeah. And so if when I look back at my personal training in, in its, its early years, I probably didn't have a very good conception of the true viability of personal training. Mm-hmm. What, when we do the math, we go, well, I've got 10 hours in a day. And if I charge 60 or 70 bucks an hour, um, then I only need to do like 25 hours of this or 30 hours a week and I'll be making absolute bank. Yeah. And what you don't realize is that, you know, and, and the example I gave before, you give away your 6 a.m. and that's your 6 a.m. gone, mm. you know, and then no one else can get 6 a.m. And what happens if that client, your next client says, I actually can only train the mornings because the evening time with the kids. Mm. That client is no longer serviceable. Um, and so I probably really didn't properly appreciate that a personal trainer's business model really needs to be broken up into three factors. Um, and this is how I would recommend doing it again. Mm. Don't price by time. Mm-hmm. Price by time slot. Yes. Rent the time price- slots. Not, not yeah. Yeah. So pro- like set them up in a hierarchy yep. um, is the first thing. Stop selling sessions. Like you're selling media. Like like you like you're selling right. an, ad, an ad at six thirty on a Monday night. Yeah. Yeah. Versus yeah. versus graveyard hour at two a.m. in the morning when the yeah. only people up are the insomniacs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you know, and it makes sense, right? Mm. Right. And and when I say it makes sense, I mean C E N T S. <laughs> like like yeah. having a strategy like that will make you money. Yeah. And it's clearly what other people have realised. The advertising world realised that a long time mm. ago that you know maybe we should be strategic with what we market at certain times and when we look at you know white goods it's no surprise they were they were selling white goods during days of our lives when it was airing it you know Mm. whenever days of our lives aired because it was speaking to the right market Um, so the first thing i do is is set up time slots actually set price points for time slots based on demand simple economics supply demand economics yeah point one Next, next point is price on results. So when you when you do discovery sessions with your clients, when you understand the goal, um, define the amount of sessions required to achieve the goal mm. or the time frame to achieve the goal, and yep. sell the journey, not individual sessions. Yeah. Now there's two reasons. Um, First of all, people respond very well to commitment once they make it. Mm. Once there's skin in the game, people will respond better to skin in the game. Um, If you create an environment 
where you're meant to be the person that's meant to mentor and guide them on a journey that's going to have its difficult moments, that's going to have hiccups, that's going to have setbacks, but you've created an environment where they can leave at any point in time. You're not creating the right environment for success. You're creating no. an environment where they can fail very easily. It's a casual setup. Right. Yeah. So that's the, that's the second thing I'd set up is shift the focus away from sessions to the journey. So then, you know, once you know the journey, then you can find out when they want to train. And then with those two factors together, the time frame of the journey alongside um, the time slot they want to take should dictate the price of the transformation. Mm. That's what you should be looking at as a young personal trainer. Mm. Because then, and, and those prices can change. You know, your morning price might, your 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. time slots, and perhaps your 5.30, p.m. time slots, can start out at $90 um, and go from there. Um, and you can change it over time, and you can give people the option of you can stay or go, and if you don't want the time slot anymore, it's now hmm. not valuable enough, fair enough, you, you, you can set that up. And you might set up your lunch time, time slot at $50 or $60 hmm. or, or whatever it might be, and, and those prices can change. But if you can shift your thinking away from being you're trading your time to I'm trading results and and trading a demand of a time slot, then that's going to help you. So maybe that's a mistake I made in some learning mm. uh, opportunities that, that you might want to take away from, mm. from that. Um, and then to be honest, actually one more thing to add is maybe hold yourself accountable to that result. Maybe mm. you need to have some skin in the game too. Mm. Um, so if you can set up some mutual skin in the game where there is a benefit to the client if they achieve the result, there's a benefit to you if you can achieve the result. And if you if you want to kind of expand more into that, go ahead and listen to what Nick Mitchell says, which we had on our podcast. That was great. Yeah. And, you know, he talks about how you can kind of engineer better outcomes for personal training clients. He's got a lot to say on that. So mm. yeah, that's, a, that's a good idea. It's a good resource. So, yeah. Yeah, so maybe that's a, a mistake that I made in the early days. Mistake as, a, as, a, as an infant gym owner or maybe an aspiring gym owner. Mm-hmm. Um, you should probably outsource most of your de- decisions. Mm. That would be what I would recommend doing. There are, there, is, there are some advantages of mentorship. There are some disadvantages of mentorship. A, a good mentor will cost you something. Because they will value themselves highly. Mm. And if they don't cost themselves or price themselves highly, avoid them. Because they've probably got money issues and they're probably not Mm. who who you want to aspire to be. But if I had someone like me in my ear every single week guiding me through the process, I would have saved a lot more money than it would have cost. Yeah. Because I would have. And, you know, we you you mentioned some mistakes you should make because they're good lessons that, that... help inform and develop you as a person, some mistakes you probably can afford not to make. Mm. One of the mistakes you you can afford not to make is spending money unnecessarily. Yep. I tell the story of when Lockie bought into the business and he looked at the numbers. I couldn't actually genuinely show him where I spent the money. Mm. I'd spent $120,000 with the final 10 or something that was left in the bank account at that point, in the bank account. But if we looked at the equipment, the equipment was worth about 35K. So where was everything else? And I didn't know. I wow. didn't know where the money had gone. Um, I could account purchases. Oh, I spent money here, I spent money here, I spent money yep. here. But I really had, if you look at my balance sheet, my balance sheet certainly didn't justify the, the injection that I'd made. Mm, mm. Um, so I would, if you're, no matter when you listen to this, if at any point in time you decide you want to open a gym, The very best expense you can spend is to outsource most of your decision-making to someone who has done this before Mm. in terms of finding facilities, what to look out for in facilities, um, setting up companies, setting up your finances, putting your offer proposition together, setting up a marketing strategy based on how much revenue you're generating, setting up your product so that you've set it up to scale early on, um, making sure you're creating incredible customer experiences, all of those things. Mm. There's a plethora of it. Most of those decisions you can make by yourself. And if you do and you succeed, you will end up probably becoming a mentor because yeah. you would have learned all the yeah. lessons. And unfortunately, I was, I was lucky enough to, to be there. But you've got to remember, if you do do that, you've just become an anomaly. 
Yeah. Because four out of five won't achieve it. Um, and so if you don't want to be a, an unfortunate statistic where you could lose a lot of money or if it's your parents' money, lose your inheritance or what, whatever it might be, um, outsource your decision-making early on. Very best recommendation I, I could I, make. I could not agree more. There were so many decisions that we made early on that seemed at the time like really good calls. And then later on, you're like, what was I th-? like?" And it, 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 we're so, you know, the, humans are easily fooled and the easiest person to fool is ourselves. And we're so right. fooled by stuff. And it's like, oh, this is a great idea. It's like, and like six weeks later, you're like, that was a terrible idea. What was I, th- what was I, was I drunk? Like that was a terrible idea. And I don't know how I thought that was a good idea. Like you just need that extra person. You know? we, we're ve- the best bullshit artist is ourselves. We mm. bullshit ourselves to make decisions all the time. Because yeah. we've, we just rationalize and re-rationalize and yeah. rationalize until we go, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, let's do it. Um, so, you know, if, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a mentor. It could potentially be a business partner. Yeah. Um, it could, it could potentially be just someone who, who you trust. But then once again, you need to outsource your decision making and, and get other opinions. Most mm. of the people I work with now are, are people who need to essentially rebuild their business because they built it without a manual. Yeah. They literally built their business without a manual. Yeah. And sometimes that works. Sometimes pretty, you can get by. Pretty rare. That's like trying to build a car off scratch and you've never, you like, why not reverse engineer it from someone who's built right. some cars? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, so, you know, that's, that's something I would highly recommend. It, it's great advice. You know, some good mentorship is it's not cost prohibitive in the sense that you won't be able to open your gym if you kept mentorship. Yep. It's yep. not like you're going to lose a significant amount of capital, hmm. but it's certainly something you should allocate for when you go, well, if you're willing to look up on Iron Edge, for example, and spend $40,000 worth of equipment, you hmm. should be willing to spend $5,000 on a mentor who will look after you for the next two years. Hmm. Uh, You'd be crazy not to. Yeah. You'd be crazy not to. It's such a small proportion mentor- of, your out- of your outlay. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and we'll, guys, uh, for those listening, we will have I- details of how to uh, link through to Carl in our show notes as well. So uh, e- easy to find there as well. Um, and one more. Uh, in terms of mistakes that we make now, I think when you get to the position that we're in, the biggest thing that we're noticing and experiencing and, and conscious of is when you scale, and it, it can be a product or it can be your whole facility or a fractal, whatever it is. When you scale, you create mess. Mm -hmm. Things get sloppy, things get missed, Mm. and ultimately you create some type of debt. Whether Mm. it's a time debt for yourself that you have to then put in time to clean up the mess, whether it's financial debt, whatever type of debt it is. Every time you scale, you also create a mess and you create a debt. What most people don't factor for when they scale is they don't factor for the mess and the debt. They think, oh, you know, if we can do this and get 15 more athletes, then things are just going to be so much better and we're going to have $1,500 more a week in our bank accounts and things will be great. But you've actually created a whole bunch of mess. All of a sudden now maybe your communication from your coaches and your athletes is dropping. Maybe they're not getting as much support. Maybe they're not feeling as support on the gym floor. Um, you know, maybe your programming systems are slipping now because there's multiple athletes and so you create these debts, right? Mm. Now you've got this time debt that you have to invest back into fixing up your programming software. Yeah, but you're so busy. Program. But you're so busy. Mm. Or, or you've got this debt um, you know, financially because you now need to hire another coach. Yeah. And so you've so so people forget that about scale. People think that scale is simply, okay, great, we can go to the moon now. Mm. So, so something that you know Lockie and I are learning is we're dealing with what has can be described as another way, but exponential growth. Um, because every new athlete we're now getting, because we're past that critical threshold, we're getting more and more referrals. Mm, you know, you've because got a network, the network effect. Has, yeah. yeah, that yeah. network effect has expanded, that there's mm. this, this constant momentum, this flywheel is spinning. Mm. And that means that for me and Lockie now, um, our, our, we have completely shifted our focus away from front-end sales and marketing. Mm. We focus all our time and energy onto personnel management, making sure the right people are in the right positions, hiring the right people, um, making sure our systems don't get messy, updating our systems, creating time for those systems to Mm. get worked on. 
That's where we're spending our time. Lockie's biggest time investment is time with our own staff. Yeah. So, you know, so, so important. Yeah. So important. So factoring for those types of things that when you scale, you create mess and there is some debt that you owe. I think that's huge. Like there's, there can be programming debt, admin debt, you know, like in software companies, there's technical debt. Like Zoom yeah. had that when they grew way too fast and they had to go back and- Everyone was like lagging. That. Yep. Yeah. Well. yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. Those are three awesome takeaways. Um, uh, last question. Uh, it's kind of a two-parter. Uh, how I I'm noticed that you mentioned you have a virtual assistant. You have a VA. Um, yeah. in, um, and I'm curious about that and about how you manage your time. I'm always interested in how people who achieve a lot actually think about their time. Okay. Well, I categorize my decisions into, th- or well, how I spend my time in three parts. Mm-hmm. Above, above the line, so high yield or high value tasks. Um, the way Nick Mitchell describes it, which I'm going to steal from is, is you know, d- be the dancing bear. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and this is this type of stuff, you know, making yeah. sure that um, I'm, we're, our, our vision is getting shared, we're giving back to the community, all of that stuff. All Being that out in the is world. Considered, Put, yeah, putting it's on, considered yeah. above the line. Yep. So I'm, I'm willing to do that stuff and make that stuff a priority. Hmm. Everything that's, that's on the line in terms of is probably trading back or at least being equal to what I'm worth mm-hmm. is sales. Mm-hmm. And everything that's below the line, I'm outsourcing. Yeah, nice. So I'm willing to do sales um, and I'm willing to play a high level perspective on marketing, but otherwise everything must be strategy um, yep. and and business development. Mm. Sending invoices is not business development because the way you can think about money is money now, money soon, money later. Mm -hmm. Any money now task, any task that means you need to get money now or money soon, a task that you should probably uh, outsource. Mm. Sending an invoice, the time it takes me to type it in, open up zero, I can be doing something else. Yeah, yeah. Um, And and even even if you think, because I I see this mistake made a lot, uh, it's easier for me to do it than to pay someone else to do it. I'd rather put that money somewhere else. But you don't put that money somewhere else. No, you don't. And yeah. you don't put your time somewhere else. You, you're still sending invoices and mm. you're still reconciling and you're still sending emails and follow-ups and you're still getting distracted by all and, this stuff. And you might say, like, you know, people, like, people will say, oh, but it's only, it's only an hour a day. It's like, yeah, but that's actually 6.25% of your waking day. But that's a right. decent, that's decent. Yeah. And if it bleeds a little bit, all of a sudden it's kind of 10% of your day was spent on yeah. a thing that's not actually taking you anywhere. And people think that they, we're not robots, right? Mm. We're not robots. So we have a waning energy supply. Yeah. If you, and everyone wants to do the shit task at the start of the day. Yeah. So you actually end up expending all your energy on sending invoices for fuck's sake. Yeah. Then doing the shit you should do and then like the, the rest of your day gets in the way once you train and speak to people or something. Yeah. What was my, what was my main thing? My, you know, high your big rock. value yeah. task. What's my big, I didn't get it done. I'll have to do that tomorrow. And then you fucking send invoices again tomorrow or you fucking mm. answer emails. Like then you do it again. <laughs> Um, it's just a, so, you know, it's, yeah. I realized this a while back. I've had Sean for a year. Um, and so Sean's Sean? been, Sean's my virtual assistant. Okay. And how does that, how um, does that work? Okay. Well, essentially what I looked at for a month. And so you do essentially homework for a month on your own behavior. And okay. you record at least for a week, but ideally a month because some things aren't weekly recurrences. Yeah. Over a course of a month, every 30 minutes, stop yourself and write on your notebook what you just did for that 30 minutes. Right. And you track your behavior for a week, a fortnight or a month, in, in my case, a month. Yep. You then divide everything that continued to repeat over time. Okay. So anything that was repetitious, but low skill, um, I began outsourcing. So then the mm-hmm. next step in the process was to film what I was doing. So I'd film me completing the task right or if it was an email you know i'm sure you've got you've had this experience you know when someone signs up you send some type of email um, yeah that's a variation or very similar to something repeatedly yeah yeah so instead of writing the email over and over again i would build a template or multiple templates based on the type of athlete that it was and i started um 
making myself redundant. So I'd film and then I'd say, this is how you do it. Sean, now you do it. Right. This is how you edit something in the website. So I'd film, I'd show them how, what you do on the back end, how you change things, how you add section blocks, how you duplicate pages, whatever. Film it, say, it, Sean, this is how you do it. Now you do it. Go make your own page for me. And I would at, just constantly start outsourcing it. Um, so instead of me, you know, when I went on paternity leave um, and I wanted to not have my number anywhere on the on the business, I didn't have to remember all the places it is on the website, all the Instagram, Facebook, Google my business, everywhere yep. where people can find me. I just say, hey, Sean, change my number everywhere it exists. Yeah. Off, off they go. A Amazing. five second delegation task saves me hours that I don't have to think about. So that's the strategy. Look at yep. everything that you continue to repeat. So Sean's interface, anytime someone needs an invoice, anytime someone needs a change to their membership, update payment details, anything that is low value that doesn't generate money for me later and down the track, mm -hmm. which is the only thing I wanna focus on, right? Oh, so I mentioned yep. that briefly, but didn't go into it. Money now, money soon, money later. The tasks I wanna focus on are money later tasks. Mm. Recurring streams later. Yeah, so how can I grow the business that's gonna have a a high yield down the track. That's mm. where I want to put my focus. So anything that's money soon or money now, outsource it. Mm. That's awesome. Outsource it. Um, um, and that's how you do it. Now they're very they're very affordable too, by the way. Um, yeah, right. Just for some context, if if you do what I did, which is you know find an agent in the Philippines who who specialises in this, you pay them a commission um, to to source the right talent for you. Uh, the median wage or maybe the mean wage is something like $3 or $4 US an hour wow. in the Philippines. So if you're a gym owner and you want to pay someone $10 US an hour, you're changing their life. You've put them in like yeah. the top 20% pay bracket. Simply That's pretty by cool, isn't it? To respond to email. So you don't even have to feel bad about it because yeah. Sean is so grateful of... That's cool. The fact that, you know, she, she's been here a long time. It's stable income. She gets to pay herself. She pays herself every month um, <laughs> through the business. And it's stable income for her. And, it, and it's it's far better than any other alternative she has. And she, this Sean has a marketing degree. She's gone to uni. She's really well spoken. Mm. Um, but the main wage and getting opportunities in the Philippines is very, it's really hard. It's tough. It's tough. Country. So she's stoked. She's tough. stoked. How she cool can work anywhere. She doesn't run to a schedule as long as things get done. Get done. She's not fast. Um, I love so it. So yeah, that is that's the strategy. And really, anyone who anyone who's started paying themselves wage, and this is how you figure it out. Yep. Once you start paying yourself a wage in your business, pay yourself for a VA. Yeah, that's 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 your milestone. That's it. The Good. moment you can start paying yourself, you should pay pay for a VA because it can start at ten hours a week and it can be forty US bucks or sixty US bucks a month. Good advice. Yeah. Okay, um, I love it. Uh, final question, um, I'm curious, how do you structure your day? So you talked about not doing the, the shitty tasks first. Do you have a particular yeah. flow that you uh, you work through? So I did, I did indicate that I didn't do well with structure. Um, and after yeah. reading it, and I'd always thought that that was a huge issue of mine. Um, and I read a book um, called Outsiders um, okay. And it, it looked at the story of eight unconventional CEOs who got um, far higher returns than the than following the index. Mm -hmm. So far higher returns for their company than if you followed and just invested in the, the ASX or if you just invested mm. in um, you know any any ETF um, or any index. Um, and a recurring theme from the CEOs was that. They were very unstructured. Right. They were they didn't follow tight bound schedules with very discrete roles. They were very fluid and adaptable. Mm. Um, so really, what I do is, and and that that resonated with me. I didn't feel like an outsider when I found out that the outsiders <laughs> do that. Um, so I don't have a diary. Sometimes. Sometimes that's consequential to me. Sometimes I make mistakes um, and, I, and I miss things. But what do you mean you don't have a diary? So you just, just remember if you've got an appointment? Yep. Wow. That's a lot of overhead reduced probably too, I imagine, because it's just people, yeah. have to, people have to a bit more coordinate with you rather than you having yeah. to coordinate with them. So yep. 
So I, I don't I don't have a diary. Um, I don't write a to do list. Um, I don't do any of that. The right. very first thing that I do is maybe do like a little Eisenhower matrix in my head, so I so can understand the, you. The quadrant one, like urgent and important. Urgent, not important, urgent. not yep. urgent, not important. Yeah. Um, obviously, um, what you're trying to do is never have anything in the urgent. Yeah. Um, because then if it is urgent, no matter what it is, it, it must take priority. So your yep. goal is, as a director or the CEO or whatever label you want to give yourself, and I don't care what you call yourself, is to mm. try and keep things out of the urgent. Um, yeah, and I, and I love the physiological example of if, you know, exercising daily is a quadrant two thing, it's important but not urgent. Uh, having a heart attack is urgent and important. And so by exercising, you keep yourself out of out of quadrant. That's a great idea. Yeah, 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 yeah it's yeah. a great concept. Mm, mm. Um, so, you know, I, I will do a little Eisenhower in my head and, and identify... Just in your head? Tasks. Yeah, just my head. Right. And then I go, well, well, what's the important thing for me to do, do today? What moves the needle forward? What are strategy-based decisions that I can make? Um, and that's really where Lockie and I are spending our time now mm. um, is, is, in, is in strategy. So I'm constantly thinking, like right now, the decisions that I'm thinking about are what's AA going to need at the end of the year? Yeah, what's nice. AA going to need in 2022? Mm. Um, so when I look at... Um, our marketing collateral when I look at the way the business is going I'm thinking what are we going to need then mm. and they're the decisions I'm trying to implement now Scaling because the there is a there. lag right that, mm. and everyone needs to understand this there is a lag in your out, uh, in you, when you input there's a lag in input to output you don't see um, that output manifest itself for months down the track mm. so if you fuck let, let's say I fuck around for the next three months you know yep. what the business sees? Sees nothing. No, no, no change even know. to the business. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't know if I fuck around, but it will see it in six months and nine yeah. months. And and the inverse is true. What I'm doing now, I'm not gonna see the return from now. There's a delay. Yeah. I was, there's a big lag. I'm gonna see mm. it in six and tw- nine months. So the the work we put in in 2020 is what is fueling our growth in a lockdown in 2021. Mm. It's that lag. Um, and that's something that we can all be reminded of because it will help us make sure we make good decisions. Um, I love it. And I love yeah. that yours is so, that you've, you've got a method that leverages your personality. It's so different to what a lot of people, it's, it's sometimes it's presented that you have to do things a certain way. Um, and I love that you could not get a more polar opposite than you and Lockie's answer, which is where he time boxes, like you guys are literally on the, you couldn't get further opposite opposites. Uh, I, I, I couldn't possibly live my life that way. Yeah, I couldn't do it. And and it infuriates Lucky, right? It yeah. absolutely infuriates him <laughs> because he's, he's, so, he's so ordered. Mm, he's mm. so ordered and so structured. And I I admire it. Yeah, but it's not like, I admire it, but I don't emulate it. Yeah. Because it would kill me. It would, it would drain the soul out of me. So I want to be someone who anyone can pop in in the afternoon and I've got nothing on. So if you want to talk to me, we can talk. Yeah. It's it's, it's how I want to be. That's great. Um, I love it. So, yeah, we, we couldn't be more different and it's probably why we are really the, the perfect yin and yang and I would always mm. hope that someone, if they do end up choosing a business partner, if that's the way they go, that they find their yang to their yin or, or yep. whatever it is. You know, Lockie is evidently, you, you can look at the both of us, you look yeah. at me and you look at Lockie. Lockie is the, the ordered, masculine, leaded mm. one, he's the type A. And I'm the, I'm the sensitive, thinking, yeah. emotional, um, behind the scenes, I'm that guy. And you, the you worst thing that. I could do for this business is be more like Lockie. Yeah, because you would not be good, and in the same way, like, so Jacob, you know, my business partner, and, and I talk, he's like, you're, a, you know, he said to me the other week, you're a 10 out of 10 at the things I'm a one at, and the reverse. Like, he said, don't just try so and, good. don't try and be me, like, we, I shouldn't try and be you. It's just, yeah. Do you know what's interesting, just uh, on a complete aside, so you've got the time boxing down one end, um, and then you've got the, the freestyling. Um, yeah. I, it's interesting, mine is in the middle of the two, which is that I like to I like to know what I have to get done, but I don't like them time box. So I have them in a things format where I can slide them around and I can move stuff. 
because I need that, I, I know enough about myself to know that I need a bit of security, that there's kind of guide rails, because maybe I'll just spend too much, I'll, I'll get too obsessed over minutia, and I'll end up in the thick of thin things all day. So I need a bit of guidance, but I still want that flexibility to be able to push stuff around. Whereas if it's in the calendar, I'm like, I'm kind of constricted. So it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and, that, and you've got to, you've got, look, we get one shot at this, right? We get one mm. shot at life. Mm. We get one shot. Why would you spend the majority of your life, your career, the, the years between 20 and 65, not living it and being it the way that feels right for you. Why would mm. you do it to yourself? Yeah, crazy. It, it, you'd be mad. Yeah. You'd be mad. So I, I'm go. doing me like he does him, <laughs> and it That's works. Great. And it works I for love us. It. Yeah. What a note to finish on. What, what great insights, Carl. Thanks so much uh, for sharing all your stuff with us. Um, we will put everything in the show notes. Um, uh, so we'll put all the AA information, the Instagram. Uh, accounts and everything there. Um, one one quick um, cheeky follow question. Favorite books? Uh, you, you're obviously a passionate learner. Uh, what are a few of your favorites? Okay, well, I, I think I go through phases with books, and they're usually theme based. Mm-hmm. So I read books based on what I think I need, what I think, or what I've identified as a blind spot. Mm-hmm in my thinking or in my behavior or my decision-making, whatever it might be. So, and I'll give you a few examples. Um, So a year ago or a year, yeah, two years ago, I knew our biggest blind spot was financial management. So I gravitated towards um, understanding finance. Mm -hmm. So I I was reading books on Buffett. I was reading books on, you know, the intelligent investor, which is, you know, a classic. I was trying to understand finance, not necessarily because it was directly applicable to AA and managing the finances of AA, but I needed to understand finance, but I need to understand investment better. I need to understand debt better. I need to understand leveraging better. So I found books that satisfied that need. Mm-hmm. You know, then, you know, go to, to last year. Last year, what I was trying to do was find strategies for helping mentees. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to I wanted to better understand systems and frameworks from all these different people who put out systems and frameworks. So I had multiple tools that I could use to try and problem solve for my mentee. So I gravitate to books like um, Mike McCallowitz and, uh, and other authors who, who specialize in systems creation for businesses right now you know books that are fascinating me are are biographies so i'm listening to jobs right now yeah great Um, the walter isaacson version yes yeah Yeah, it's great it's uh, it's it's audible so it's 24 hours Mm. which is i can't imagine what bloody size it's a big book but (laughs) yeah it would have to be but but i'm interested in, in that because I see myself and, and Lockie is, is really at quite a fast rate moving away from the detail of the business mm. where our roles are, are quickly changing. So I'm trying to navigate, well, how am I going to, to find where that is mm. um, and let go and let go of everything? Um, you know, so that, that's been really interesting. So that's what I'm into. But I'm also into, you know, I've, I've re-downloaded um, 1984 because grand book, you know, it's a fantastic book. Obviously, it required learning if you want to have a, a good understanding of um, the 20th century. I think it's mm. absolutely required learning for that. Mm. Um, but I see, and perhaps I'm wrong. I would, I hope I'm wrong. But I see some scary parallels between um, some of some of the decision making that our government's doing, and perhaps they think it's for good reason too. Mm. You know, um, I see some scary parallels between what what we're observing and what the world uh, more globally is observing, and what we what we read about in 1984 when we were 14 years old. Mm. And so, you know, I'm I'm going back there because um, I wanna I wanna understand if am I wrong here? Is there something I've missed? So so rather than having a favorite book, um, what I try and do is I I find. I listen to and understand my blind spots and then go out looking for books out and, and remedy provide them. 
yeah. that provide solutions for that. So I can feel like I've closed off a bit of a blind spot there. I've, I've got some more perspective on it. That's and who knows what approach. that'll be in a year's time. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Okay, that's amazing. Thanks once again. And uh, guys, all the show notes will be uh, there for you and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Carl. Cheers. Thanks, Tom. You do this episode is proudly brought to you by Iron Edge. At Core Advantage, Iron Edge are our trusted choice due to the versatility, durability, and overall quality of their equipment. Whether it's for a home gym fit out or a commercial gym, you can find everything you need at ironedge.com.au. Okay, hope you enjoyed that episode. You'll find all the relevant show notes over at coreadvantage.com.au. Uh, also on the website, you can find more information about our uh, athletic development services, education, uh, short courses, and uh, everything else we're up to. So that's coreadvantage.com.au. Cheers, guys. See ya.